I want to bring in Greg Morris. Uh, it's always great to have you on the show, Greg. I know, uh, you know, I read your article from March 12th. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar, Greg does have an article or has a blog here at Stock Charts Dancing with the Trend. And uh, really, I thought it was a, a really nice rules-based uh, trend-following model that you talked about um, on Monday. I don't know what you have to talk about today and what you're going to go over, but um, I, I did want to just point out that I thought this article was great for those of uh, those of our listeners out there that like to catch up. Just go in and look for Dancing with the Trend under the blogs, and uh, I, I would catch up with uh, Greg's latest article. Great article. Thanks, Tom. You're very welcome. So what do you got for us? I mean, you know, we haven't talked to you in a while, and there's a lot that's been happening in the market. I mean, we've seen a, a big scare, huge move down. There's been a lot of uh, discussion here on the show over the past several weeks with many guests, whether, you know, this is the start of a bear market, whether it's a uh, just a correction before we make another push to the upside. There's a ton of discussion about the dollar. You know, the dollar has been under a lot of pressure since December of 2016. Is that bottoming or is it ready to head lower? I mean, do you have any thoughts about any of what's been going on here or do you kind of just uh, try to ignore the noise and just stay with your longer term i uh i just stay with my model uh, in fact when i started writing about a rules-based trend following model uh the number of subscribers went through the roof um uh, i've talked about it off and on for a couple three years on, on the blog i don't when people ask me what the market's going to do i say i have absolutely no idea and i honestly don't think anyone else knows either <laughs> and yes. I, tr I try not to offend everybody, but just just a few at a time. Are you just uh, and the beauty of following the beauty of following the model is the model will adjust to whatever the market's doing, and I don't have to know what the market's going to do because I just fo follow a rules based model. That's the beauty of the whole thing. Yeah, I always like to think I can predict what's going to happen, and sometimes I'm right. And then, of course, you know what the other side of it is. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I used to. Uh, like on the cartoon, Net, I'm sorry, CNBC, I used to uh, see all the talking heads come on there and make their predictions. And I thought there's no consequence for them to make a bad prediction because uh, they still get invited back on. And uh, there's one guy that's just on. He's I don't think he's ever right. He's just on the wrong side of the market every time, but he's still being invited back. He must be a good advertiser. Yeah, I always wonder about that. I know back in, and I hate bringing up names because these are probably great people and all, but sure. I know back in 2006, 2007, right before the financial crisis, and of course, you know, it's hard to predict that kind of a move to the downside. But I remember Dick Beauvais coming on to CNBC and talking about financial stocks just day in and day out and how they kept getting cheaper and cheaper and how they were a great buy. And this was before, right before the financial system, you know, essentially almost sure. collapsed. Sure. Uh, you know, many of the stocks took years and years and years to recover. And that's exactly what I thought about at the time, what you were just talking about, because they kept inviting him back to talk about financials. And I'm like, really? Is this well, the, the expert? They yeah, the, po the poor souls that follow fundamental analysis, you know, when prices go down, they can go down daily, but the earnings are only reported quarterly. So the fundamentals get really good as the prices go down because they're all related to price in the numerator. Exactly, um, and it just uh, bear markets just destroy that. So, but today I, I kind of want to talk about a couple of philosophical things that I I I've, I've been working on some blog articles, and I'm I'm trying to include these in one of them in the future. But uh, one of them is I call knowledge versus wisdom, and then I try to tie that to technical analysis. Uh, you know, stock charts is kind of like Microsoft Excel; it's just got an abundance of tools and indicators and capabilities. And people, I don't, I use maybe 10% of Microsoft Excel and mm -hmm. I probably use 10% of stock charts. I don't use all the tools that are on stock charts. Uh, it takes a lot of knowledge to understand technical indicators and uh, people should understand what's behind, for instance, stochastics. If someone is using stochastics and they can't explain what it is and why they're using it, that's, that's kind of dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think that knowledge, uh, as far as technical analysis goes, is, is how to use indicators effectively. And you follow all the blog authors on stock charts, world-renowned technical analysts. They don't use all the indicators. Most of them use the same thing over and over again because they found the indicator that works best for them or indicators that works best for them. So 
so the knowledge part is is which indicators to use effectively the wisdom comes in is is uh which of those indicators to use in your analysis, especially if you're trying to make money doing it. Uh, I'm on record as saying uh, the indicators that require extreme subjectivity, um, I avoid them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see some people that can use them and they seem to use them very well, but uh, Fibonacci, GAN, Elliott Wave, uh, and, and just for Aaron, I'll say angled trend lines. Um, <laughs> I have never been able to use those effectively. And so the knowledge part is, is that I don't use them. I have the knowledge not to use them. Mm-hmm. So that it kind of reminds me of something my, my friend John Ellers told me a long time ago. He said, knowledge is knowing the tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting one in a fruit salad. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. I like that one. I'm going to borrow it. <laughs> Steal it. I did. <laughs> And then, then the other thing is, is I've heard people say technical analysis is science. My God, whoever says that doesn't know what science is. It's an art. Uh, real quick, I'll explain what science is. Science is something that you can do repetitively and reach the same conclusions. For example, I know that at sea level on a standard day, uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees centigrade, pure HTO water will boil at 100 degrees centigrade and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's science because every time you do that, it will boil at that temperature. And of course, as you raise, go up in altitude and there's less pressure and uh, the electrons don't escape as much, it'll boil at a lower temperature. That's science. Technical analysis is not science. If science would mean that if stochastics got to 98.6 and then tick down, it means the market's going to go down. We know that doesn't work that way. So is it is it science, Greg? If my uh, if one of my trades is down 10 percent, my blood starts to boil. That that's that's called bad science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah, that, that's a good analogy there. But so technical analysis is an art, and I get pretty critical of some things that I see out there, but that's by just my personal opinion because, because it is an art. Everybody finds their own tools and their own techniques and whether they're just educators or they're practitioners, it doesn't matter. Everybody gravitates to what works for them. Uh, you guys do a great job with what you do. Well, thank you. So Thanks. I wanted to talk a little bit about breadth. Um, about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called, The Complete Guide to Market Breadth Indicators, an entire book on the subject. And the reason I did was twofold. One is I've been using breadth for many, many decades. uh, And all the big technical analysis book authors, uh, Kirkpatrick, Pring, Murphy, they only treated breadth in maybe a chapter. Uh, and I thought it was worthy of an entire book. So I I did that. And then a couple of years ago, we put the entire book on Amazon. This sounds like a sales pitch. And uh, we, Chip, through uh, the programmers there at Stock Charts, we put all of the breadth indicators on Stock Charts. And so they're all there now, and they all begin with an exclamation point BI. But here's the value of breadth. Breadth is like an equal weighted measure. And there's a chart that I, I like to show that shows the NASDAQ composite on the top This is the year 2007. Now, most people, when they're talking about the market, certainly the talking heads will use price capitalization weighted indices. The NASDAQ is one. The S&P is one. Uh, The Dow is a price weighted, but it works the same way, which means that the largest stocks in that index carry most of the weight that cause the index to move. For example, on the NASDAQ 100, the top 10 stocks account for 47% of the movement. Breadth, on the other hand, treats every stock equally. Exxon Mobil could be up $10 one day, and Bubba's Pizza, the smallest capitalized stock on the NASDAQ, could be down a penny, and they just canceled each other out. One was an advance, and one was a decline. What happens is, as the markets start rolling over in these periods of distribution, like market tops, you don't really know it at first, but when the market has stopped going up 
and it starts going sideways, you know, like we're seeing now, and I'm, I'm not making a prediction, but the market hasn't gone, done much this year, especially falling 2017, people will tend to loosen up on their, what we consider their riskier holdings, which are generally small caps, micro caps, and maybe some mid caps. And they will go into what they perceive to be safer stocks, feeling that the blue chips, the large caps are safer. Uh, that's a very common trait, certainly in institutional invest investors, uh, and because the, they'll like to talk about it. Well, what happens when they do that, that causes these capitalization weighted indices to continue up moves. When in fact, breadth, as you can see there in 2007, that's the NASDAQ advanced decline line, is in a big decline early in 2007, long before the top in the market. You can see that signature almost every time we have a market top. Breath will deteriorate much quicker and much earlier than price and cap weighted indices will. That's the beauty of market breadth, uh, is that early warning indication. And I, I've, 98 and 99 was a perfect example. Breath, uh, Russell 2000, which is another kind of a proxy for breadth if you don't have breadth data, uh, it deteriorated for two years before the Dow and the S&P followed suit starting in the beginning of 2000. And you can back, go back over history and you can see this breadth signature at almost every top. The bad news is it's kind of like some economic indicators that call 20 out of the last 12 recessions. In other words, it will happen and it doesn't mean it's a top. You'll see breadth deteriorate. It's, it's for other reasons, but it almost always does it at the actual tops. So that, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to point out that breath is a very important tool to keep in your toolbox for a technical analyst. Um, uh, quick question yeah. for you. Sure. Uh, somebody asked, uh, you know, why is the advanced decline line equal to such an enormous number like 30,000? Because uh, it's okay. It's, it's cumulative. You take every day, you take the advances minus the declines, and then you add that as you go along. The number that makes up the advanced decline line is meaningless, absolutely, totally meaningless, because it all depends on where you started the calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you start it back when 1971, when the NASDAQ began, uh, it's, it's going to be a totally different number than if you started it somewhere in the 80s. So the number on a cumulative measure like that is a meaningless number. You're just looking at the shape of the line, and usually comparing it to the price or cap weighted index. All right. The other thing I want to talk about is an old friend of mine has passed away, uh, Richard Arms, Dick Arms. Oh, uh, right. Dick was 83. He was the guy that created the Arms Index. And in the early days, it was called the Traders Index or TREN. And I think everybody's heard of TREN. It used to be on all the quote machines. This was back in the 70s. TREN and uh, Dick, would, I'd have Dick in Dallas all the time to uh, – do seminars with me. Great guy. Uh, his first wife uh, required a lot of care there in the early 2000s. He's, he's kind of off the radar for a while, but apparently uh, he was having some heart issues and he was 83. He just, he lived in Albuquerque. A great guy. He's also the one that created, I, I don't think he created it, but he, he wrote books on equivolume where the width of the bar is representative of the volume for the day. So you could see it all in one chart. Stock charts has all of those on there. Very recently, he did a, an expose that's published on stock charts, I think, on not, not just candle volume, but uh, uh, candlestick volume, where he shows the width of the candle is also the volume. He used to tell me that he, he was wrapped up in volume and this is back when volume was very meaningful because there weren't dark pools and all these other strange places to make trades. He used to tell me when he'd go to lunch, he'd tell his secretary, he'd be back in 200,000 trades. <laughs> Instead of using time, he used volume. Mm -hmm. Great, great guy. Uh, technical analysis lost a good one there. So yes. we actually do have the trend uh, on stock charts in our sure. point. Uh, market indicator chart back. 
So yeah, yeah, and it's a it's kind of Dick said he if he was doing it all over again he would have inverted it because it's kind of an inverse indicator when it's up it's it's bad when it's down it's good. I I, I think it's advances divided by declining volume in the numerator, and then declines divided by up volume in the denominator. That's the formula for it. And um, he did a version called open arms, which I think is kind of uh, encompassing and grabbing. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> uh, where he smoothed the components before he did the calculation. But they're all, they're very interesting uh, measures. And like I said, they're all on stock charts, every one of them. Yeah, Along, I just happened to pull one up for everybody. Okay. So, uh, you can see that. And it, it is a pretty handy one. I know uh, we do invert it, that scale. Yes, uh, there you go. I think Carl uh, said that it's the trick is if it goes over two, that the next day, I guess, is supposed to be an up day, something to that effect. Of course, yeah. it was perfect, but. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's one of those measures that you look at the, it, when it's at extremes, usually. Mm -hmm. So. There we go. so uh, the other thing, and this is nothing to techno today is Pi Day. So I guess it's a time to be irrational. Oh, there you go. Three oh, uh, that's so bad. I should have known that as a math major. I should have yeah, pi, I tell people my my pin that I use on the websites are the last four digits of pi. <laughs> pi, pi is a, pi is one of those numbers that doesn't end. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's so bad. Math. Uh, now what are you gonna do? Let's see, I, I see I've got a few more minutes. There's just a couple other little things I see. Uh, I'm very critical of, of modern finance and especially the financial media. Um, they put out such bad information so often. And I'm not talking about stock. I'm talking about the news, financial news shows. Mm -hmm. You'll hear them say cash on the sidelines a lot. Well, there's this market should go on up because there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. Well, well, that's, that's a complete misunderstanding of the secondary marketplace. There's no cash on the sidelines. When you buy a stock, somebody has to sell it to you. It's just that simple. Hmm. Or when you sell a stock, there has to be a buyer. You can't go buy stock off a shelf somewhere. That's the primary marketplace during IPOs, et cetera. So there's no such thing as cash on the sidelines. Uh, you know, a, a company or a huge investor may have cash on the sidelines. And, and if they said it that way, that might be meaningful. But to just say it generically, uh, there's no such thing. The other thing, uh, and I think everybody's heard them say that it's a, it's a big down day today because there's more sellers than buyers. Yeah. Well, that goes along with the same thing I was just saying. There's the same number of sellers and buyers because you can't sell something unless somebody buys it from you. Uh, what they probably should say, there's more selling enthusiasm than buying enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that would be that would be more meaningful. So mm -hmm. anyway, I always like to talk about those because I still hear them on the major financial television stations all the time. Uh, it's It's very sad. Mm -hmm. Pay it, and, and and as advice to people, you want to learn something about technical analysis. Stay at StockCharts.com. Chart School is the best book out there on the on technical analysis, and it's absolutely free. Right here. Yeah, it's dynamite. Yeah. Well, and we also have a lot of folks who, you know, Arthur Hill comes on the show, and of course, he's the author of a lot of that, uh, a lot of those oh. articles. On oh yes, yes. And uh, I mean, it's great having the the educational side of stock charts coming onto our show to explain uh, a number of the different indicators and the, some of the common indicators that people use and so forth. Because again, I, I go back to your comment that you said earlier, Greg, I completely agree with you. I think that if you're using a, a an indicator and you're buying a stock, you're going to put out thousands of dollars to buy a stock because a line is pointing in a certain direction. Um, I would, maybe rethink that strategy. I think you better understand what that line means, number one, and maybe, you know, go back, back test it, look to see what it's actually telling you. Um, and then maybe use that in, um, you know, in uh, corroboration with other technical signals and so forth. I think just pinning your hopes on a stock because one line is doing something, I think is a huge mistake. Well, the good news is they probably don't do that very long. Uh, the, well, the other thing is I get asked, what, what moving averages do you use? Well, 
I've got my own little rules. I use arithmetic smoothing up to 64 days, and from 65 on up, I use exponential. Um, it's just that simple. But that because that's what works for me. In other words, when I see a moving average on something, I don't want to have to sit there and say, well, which moving average should I use? I want to use the same one every time. And the advantage of exponential on longer term is, is when the price goes through it, the moving average reverses right there. Where an arithmetic moving average, it, can, it takes a long time to roll over, especially especially if you're using big, like 200-day moving averages. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just because of the, the mathematics of the, of the moving average. The exponential is going to reverse immediately mm -hmm. when the price goes through it. So now are you, would you say that you are much more of a longer term trader? Or oh yeah. Yeah. I tell the story back in the eighties. I, I, I lost so much money trying to be a trader. I, I just realized I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you, 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 I have, a, I've bought a lot. I have master's degrees in what not to do based on the cost of tuition, but I just, I just didn't have the mentality or the personality to be a trader. I just, uh, I don't know, uh, why I just, I'm, I'm glad I realized it at some point, but I, I am strictly a model follower. Now I've been doing this for 20 models for 25 years. It's a rules based trend following model. And, uh, I still, the model still used by companies today that, uh, use it. Mm -hmm. yep. And so I started this series. In fact, you, I see it on the screen there. This is the, I'm not real good at coming up with fancy names for my articles. So this is number six in that series. And here I've gotten into some price based indicators. Um, I started out with, the, you know, you go back and read them in order and, and it, I'm just kind of building as it goes along. And there's probably going to be maybe 40 or 50 articles total before I get all finished with it. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's was, well, it's, it's the model has managed to uh, over $6 billion. Wow. Yeah. Now, is that, uh, is that going to be in book form at some point or are you just, well, it, in, in my book, investing with the trend, which is my latest and last book, uh, I say that emphatically, I'm not writing anymore, but that's, uh, I cover that book is in three almost independent sections. One is a, it's a very detailed critique of modern finance. Another is all about risk and drawdowns. And then the last chapter, I talk about uh, a rules-based trend following model. Obviously, I can't give the excruciating details of it because it's still a functional model today. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'm able, in my blog, I'm able to explain it a little bit better. Yeah, I think probably that's the one, you know, you just touched on the word risk. And I think that's probably one thing that a lot of unsuccessful traders and investors don't pay enough attention to when they're either trading short term or investing for the long term. You know, everyone gets in with the anticipation <clears throat> that whatever they buy is going to go higher. Yes. And I think a lot of folks don't realize or, well, they certainly realize it, but they don't plan for what they're going to do in the event that prices go against them. And I always say, you know, you have to have your target in mind and what, I don't care whether you're trading, you know, for today this week or whether you're looking out 10 or 15 years i mean there's got to be a there's got to be a goal in mind when you get into something and of there course. also needs to be an exit strategy in the event that things just turn on you i mean we saw back in 2000 all the dot com stocks that absolutely fell apart and then we saw in 2007 2008 all the financial stocks that fell apart i mean there's got to be an exit strategy where you don't get involved in something where it just takes you down to zero my model uses stops on every holding period. Do I, do I have time for about a 30 second story on I risk? Um, as long as you want, actually. I, I used to, uh, when I was in front of the big warehouses trying to sell them on technical analysis, I found out being critical of modern finance was a lot easier because they believed that for so long. But I'd put up a histogram of the annual returns of the Dow going back to 1897 or something. And you could clearly see by looking at that chart that the market on an annual basis was up about two thirds of the time. And I say, if I was selling you an index fund or a buy and hold strategy, I'd say, look, it's up two thirds of the time. And so I say, well, then let's play a game. I say, I promise you it's a fair game. It's $10 to play. You can play as many times as you want. 
And if you win, you're going to get a million dollars and there's no strings attached. That's, that's exactly how it was. I said, how many want to play? And everybody raises their hand. And I say, and, and the, the mathematical odds of winning are one time out of six. And so everybody raises their hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, the game is Russian roulette. <laughs> <laughs> how many want to play now? And of course, nobody know, wants to play Russian roulette because right. Because the risk of playing Russian roulette is severe. Well, you should treat the risk of the market the same way. You should always understand what the risk is of every trade you put on. And the way you, way you deal with that is have some exit strategy, whether it's a stop, a reverse, whatever you do. It doesn't matter what it, what it is, but you have to have the discipline to follow it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, the discipline is the other key word. I mean, risk is one thing. You know, you mentioned with your trend following uh, model and, and be, it being rules based. I mean, in the, that in itself is a disciplined approach to following the market. You have rules. Um, rules and I, think yes. everyone, I think everyone in their trading, even if it's short term trading, should have rules. That they Invi follow. Inviolable rules. Exactly. Yes. And you got to be very careful making rules because you want to make sure you have the ability to follow them. I got an interesting email from someone uh, just recently, and I won't mention any names, but they they kind of scolded themselves when they sent me an email talking about Navistar, how they got into Navistar NAV, and uh, the stock recently broke down. They you know they mentioned, hey, I saw it break below this level, this level, this level, but I kept holding it, and now you know I'm embarrassed to say, but you know I've got a pretty big loss, and I'm going to have to get out of it now. But I think part of that, you know, I hate to say that it's a it's a good thing, but it certainly is a lesson. I mean, I learned some of my biggest lessons in, in trading stocks by losing money. Yes. You paid tuition. I did. I paid a no. lot of tuition, especially back in the late 90s into early 2000s. That's when I stopped uh, trading options. That was, yeah. that was a big lesson for me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like uh, I, I traded futures in the early 80s. And uh, gosh, I, I was just... Uh, I made it, I was just making good money. I was thinking about quitting my job and all that. And, and before it was all over, I ended up writing a check for about $8,000 to close the account. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, well, just I know, en um, enjoyed the leverage, but uh, only on the upside. One yeah. of the things um, Charles Kirkpatrick in one of his books did say is that, you know, finding and buying a stock is really the easy part. The hard part is figuring out how to exit it. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think Char gonna, Charlie's I, got a really good book called Technical Analysis. It's kind of up there with Prang's and Murphy's. Yep, we had him on. Believe yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, he's a great oh. guy. <laughs> yeah, that was a very interesting uh, uh, session of Market Watchers Live having uh, Charlie on the show. That was really uh, eye-opening, for sure. And well, thanks again for uh, joining us, Greg. It's always a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. And we're going to play golf soon. Okay, I look forward to it. You guys do a great job. Keep up the good work, and thanks. Oh, you're so nice. All right. Signing off. <laughs>